today is about hearing from uh, two different speakers, uh, Ruthann Baxter, Museum Services Team Manager at the University of Edinburgh, and Dr Tom Flint, Public Engagement Lead for uh, the School of Computing and Lecturer in Interaction Design at Edinburgh Napier University. Um, they're going to speak about very different things, um, but I think both of them um, are using technology to connect with different audiences, different communities, um, and we all know more, more than ever right now, we're all needing to use imagination and creativity to keep engaging with our visitors and our customers. So hopefully, um, Ruthann and Tom's talks will give you some ideas, and um, if you've got things that you're doing that you want to share with us, we'd be delighted to hear about them. Um, if you can get in touch with us after after the webinar. Um, but please, yes, um, if you can put your questions in the chat box and we'll do our best to, to, to get the speakers to answer them. Um, just very briefly, Interface has helped lots and lots of businesses develop immersive experiences working with academics across Scotland. Um, I think Pooja Katara is with us today um, from Sense City augmented reality tours of Glasgow um, and she was working with uh, Glasgow School of Art. We've had lots of digital reconstructions and, and VR work with uh, the Smart History team at St Andrews University uh, and Tom at Napier um, has been involved with a lot of work with, with different visitor attractions and um, we've also worked with recently on projects um, about managing visitor flow for visitor attractions, visitor sentiment for destinations, using artificial intelligence to look at guest behaviour with hotels and personalise those experiencing experiences using the data that we found. Um, so these are kind of the, some of the things that we've worked on. If you are interested at all in finding out more, you can get in touch with us. Um, so at this point, I'd like to hand over to our first speaker, Ruthann Baxter uh, from University of Edinburgh Museum Services. Ruthann. Um, thank you very much for having me this afternoon. Uh, so what I'll do is um, I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, so before I talk about the main uh, project for today, which is the Take 30 Together virtual program, I'm going to take you back to the old world, which was March 2018. Um, and basically two things happened that month. One was that I discovered that at the University of Edinburgh in that academic year, the demand for the university's counselling services had gone up by 22%. Um, I need to break that down a little bit because it can make it sound as if going to university makes um, young people very stressed and anxious. Um, it was a combination of a few things. One, actually a reflection of the fact that um, a lot of people now find it much easier to talk and share when they have mental health difficulties. And also the universities have been doing um, a much better job at widening participation. So bringing into the student body students who may previously not have considered going to university. And because of this sort of um, some deprivation backgrounds, those young students can come into the university with pre-existing um, needs for mental health support. The other thing that happened was I was on a train back from York. I picked up a newspaper and the headline was all to do with uh, social prescribing, which was something that was a very new concept to me. Um, so for those of you who don't know what social prescribing is, it is essentially an approach for connecting people with non-medical sources of support or resources within the community that is likely to help them with a health problem. Um, the research at that time suggested that about roughly 30 to 40 percent of a GP's weekly appointments are actually people who have at the root a social problem rather than a medical problem. And if you can sort out the social problem, the medical problem tends to go away. And by that, it's usually things like isolation and loneliness leading to anxiety and depression and so on. So I was very aware that there was a rising um, number of young people with mental health difficulties and the social prescribing could uh, provide a level of support and all the research I looked around in 2018 were all related to mostly sport and the arts. There was no evidence about heritage helping and also most of the research was very much with older communities, um, not really anything specific for young people or the student age group. So I came back to university and I thought we have in our mothership young people museums and galleries, we've got GPs, we've got counselling services. So I brought round a table our um, Andy Shanks, our head of student wellbeing, representatives from the Student Association, 
the head of the counselling service at the university and a lead GP from the university's um, health centre. Also, I had Dr. John Ennis and Dr. John Gillies, who were extremely helpful um, and made sure that everything we were doing was as, as close as it could be to what we were aiming to, to support. Um, those were the two uh, events, uh, two programmes that were piloted before Christmas. Um, and the, there was a large, the, there was a small group session which were very structured and took 90 minutes and they were on a set date at a set time for six weeks. The other one, Take 30, um, that was more for the student who might be um, suffering from anxiety and the idea of joining a small group of strangers would simply add and exasperate their difficulty. So we created a, a Take 30 booklet and that was all of this was done very much in partnership with a massive raft of cultural and heritage partners across the city and we could not have done this without them. Um, and the so the Take 30 booklet was where you went off on your own, you got um, 30 minutes uh, prompt and response activities in each of the venues that were listed um, there on the screen. Um, and the reason that I came up with Take 30 was because um, Dr. Paul Dolan, who is a professor of behavioural science at the London School of Economics, had said that we basically have two things that impact on our, our well-being and happiness. And there are two questions. One is, um, how do we spend our time? And the other is, how stressed are we? And he, his recommendation was that we would all benefit from finding 30 minutes a day to do something that makes us feel good. So um, that's where the Take 30 came from. And when lockdown started, a number of the pilot participants um, were in touch with me, sort of saying that, that you know, they were finding it difficult. Is there anything um, from the museum service that could help them in lockdown? Therefore, it was going to have to be digital. Um, I'm also aware that people lost their sense of routine and routine can be very important to keeping somebody's mental health in balance. So very, very quickly, um, I sort of decided that maybe two hours a week, we could provide a digital visit, if you like, a virtual visit to um, a number of uh, heritage and visitor attractions that are heritage related across the UK. And then I was rather slow to realize that because it was virtual, we could go anywhere in the world. So you'll see there a list of what heritage can do to support people. Um, and again, there the point is, this is all non-clinical. It's not handing out uh, drugs. And that's not to say that, um, as, as the GPs have said, these uh, sort of alternative support mechanisms are not necessarily instead of, but um, if possible, instead of taking medication. But often you have to sort of take both to, to depending on, on the, the person. Um, so if you want to move on to the next slide, uh, hopefully the next slide, if memory serves me, um, will be some of the places we visited. Is it a slide of pictures? There's a slight pause, here we are. Yeah, uh, it's the what is Take 30 Together virtual. Thank you, okay. So um, you can, you can I, I don't have them in front of me, but um, Basically, it is a heritage based uh, non clinical virtual program and it's available to um, all students and, and staff at the university. Um, the, the, why are we doing it? It's all sort of listed there. I won't go into too much detail on that. But essentially, um, obviously, being a university, we very much want our uh, students to succeed in every way. And, um, you know, academically is one of the, the key factors. So, um, they has been, there's been lots of reports, lots of research done on the key problems that students can have that disrupt their mental health. And often it can be a, a lack of social relationships. So this virtual program is also to help build a sense of community and um, help them to sort of e meet in this situation. Um, other students who, once we get back onto campus, they will um, maybe feel that they've got a, an element of a friendship and, and social connection with um, already. So if you want to go on to the next slide. Yeah, we've got the venues up now, Ruthann. Terrific. So you might be wondering, where have we visited? And um, so far in the main, we have visited various um, places. So what you should see on the slide in no particular order, Dumfries House, the RAF Museum, Payne's Hill Park, and Inner Peffrey Library. You'll see in there that um, I have uh, selected quite a few um, rurally based uh, heritage um, stories and, and venues. Um, 
and I think that's another wonderful thing about the project is that you can take people out to places that they might not um, be able to visit as easily if they're based in the city and they're students. Um, but what is really wonderful, I'm at this slide, I'm just going to stop on that slide so that you can sort of take in the beauty of those places. Um, and at this point, I'll just sort of highlight. So the things with the prescribed culture take 30 programme is that there is no budget required. So all of the guest speakers have very, very kindly donated their time. I will say that some of the guest guides have been on furlough, um, but they were happy to, to sort of um, talk about uh, their venue or first, in some cases, they spoke about heritage that isn't actually related directly to their, their workplace, but it's just um, something else that they have a, um, an expertise to speak about. So there's no money required. And also from a point of view of tech, it's essentially this, you basically need Zoom or Microsoft Teams, something like that, um, where you can get a number of people onto, into a room, so to speak. Um, what I will say is that the purpose of this is about well-being. It's not a numbers game. Um, at the moment, we have on average about 18 uh, people jumping in on these sessions. Um, we have a full register of 68 people at the moment, but some are only available on Wednesdays, some are only available on Fridays. If it got beyond sort of 35 in a session um, regularly, I would then look to replicate it, um, repeat it all again, because um, it's, it would lose its impact on the e-social bonding side of things. And it is a well-being event. It's, it's not sort of um, a, a huge uh, lecture or anything like that. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, I think in the next slide, you should be seeing an example of the invite that the members get. Yeah, there's a little pause between slides, but um, I'm sure no Heather is on it, so it will <laughs> no problem. Up. Okay, yeah, so that's it. Um, brilliant. So what, what we've got there um, is that one was for Dumfries House. And what I tend to do, obviously, um, the, the university, my, my senior management are, are very pleased that um, I'm spending my time doing uh, this initiative. However, they, um, much as they'd love to promote uh, lots of wonderful heritage um, places across the UK, they, we have our own collections. Um, so what I try to do as far as is possible is in every invite, I make a collections connection. So this means that um, we are sort of sharing the breadth of our own university collections uh, to these um, students and staff, who many of whom may not be aware that the University of Edinburgh has their own collections and has their own museums. Um, and I did a very quick survey um, last week, which would have been week six, and the results were that 40% of the members um, jumping in on the programme were not aware of the university's collections and the museum. So it's, it's doing a bit of a marketing job uh, for us as well. Um, so if you want to go on to the next slide, what you will see next, hopefully, um, is a bit of a breakdown of who is uh, who are members at the moment. Um, and again, I'm slightly doing this from memory, but I think uh, it is predominantly postgraduate students. Um, so it's about a third undergrads and two thirds postgrad. Um, the abbreviations that you will see, we have three colleges at the university. There's the College of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences, where you'll see that the majority of um, members are, are sort of from that college. Then you've got uh, the College of Science and Engineering and finally the College of Medicine and Vets. Um, and again, uh, we've got staff and then the others, which is the sort of a strange one, that is mostly made up of volunteers and a few other people who in the city who heard about the initiative. And uh, when it's something to do with well-being, it's very difficult to to sort of say no to anybody. Um, the majority of students are still in Edinburgh, but some of them managed to get back to their home countries and some of them um, are permanently remote students to the University of Edinburgh. So we have people dialing in on the sessions from Nigeria, Canada, China. Um, I think there's somebody there from Greece. So it's a very international mix of members coming in uh, on the sessions. Um, the other thing I'll say is that the survey that we did last week, um, we've, it was only sent out uh, on Friday, but so far about half of the membership have um, sort of sent in their feedback. And at the moment, uh, 
the, the highlight things are that 100% of them are agreeing with the statement that it is supporting their mental health in lockdown. 100% would recommend it to others, and um, particularly those struggling with their well-being in lockdown. Um, 100% uh, were introduced to new places and intend to visit those places after lockdown. So that's good for the um, venues that we have highlighted through the programme so far. There's a number of uh, sort of feedback samples there. Um, these I, I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I know there's one from Suki, and Suki is uh, doing a master's in dental law. He's based down in London. And I think Suki's, um, one of his comments was that it's great to be able to learn new things and meet new people while in lockdown. Um, Oki was, uh, his first visit was to Inner Pepri Library and he is based in Nigeria and he's a, a master's student in trauma surgery um, and he said something along the lines of it's just been great uh, to break up his, his routine um, with this programme and, and he's wonderful, he's, he's very enthusiastic and comes to as many as he possibly can. Um, and the other one is more a member of staff from the University of Valerie and um, Valerie just again finds it a great break from the, the day to day and that was one of the main points of this um, uh, Take 30 programme was to really just give people an hour to take them out of the day to day by taking them out of the day to day if you know what I mean. Um, and, uh, and I think it's really working. Uh, it's sort of definitely much more of a, an ibuprofen rather than an antibiotic. So it will give short term um, relief to, to some people during lockdown. And after that, um, there should be uh, at this point, maybe a slide or a slide coming up that shows where we're off to next. So the first six weeks, like I said, were all very much um, UK based heritage venues. And, and related to heritage collections uh, in Britain. But now we're going up across the world. Um, some of the places coming up in the near future, Vancouver Art Gallery and the National Museum of Qatar. Uh, we've already had one session with the um, uh, RMIT University Archives and we're going to be going back there every month. Um, we are also hopefully having a monthly visit to the National Museum of Qatar and then Fridays, those will happen on Wednesdays and Fridays will remain um, sort of visits to completely um, different places as one-off uh, one visits. So I guess really if, if you have um, a heritage story and it doesn't have to be uh, a historic venue, it doesn't have to be a museum or a gallery, um, you know, it might be one of the places that we're going to have a chat with is um, out in East Lothian, there is um, Mongo's Mill. So they have a wonderful, beautiful story about bread making. Um, so we're hopefully going to get them set up. Lots of the venues do have virtual tours. Sometimes the session itself will be um, exploring the, the virtual tour together. In other cases, you get the links to the tours beforehand and the actual session is more um, a PowerPoint presentation and then a Q&A with the, the guest guide or the guest guides. Um, so what I would say to the people in on this on this uh, webinar is if you do have a heritage story, whatever that looks like, and you believe it can be um, a, a half hour that would just help somebody come away from their day to day, give them a little bit of rest by distract them, if you like, for want of a better word, with some um, interesting past and it can be entertaining and educational, then I would really love to hear from you. If you um, would consider creating uh, like a Take 30 virtual programme of your own, what is extremely important, and I can't stress this enough, is that you have a genuine interest and care about people because this is a mental health and wellbeing programme. Um, and what I mean by that is I check the um, prescribed culture inbox every evening at eight o'clock because we have students who are sitting on their own, their, maybe their families in Mexico, and if they feel that lonely, uh, and that they're sort of randomly emailing at eight o'clock at night, it's nice for them just to get a reply back and they know that sort of they're not on their own. There's no, no sense of therapy, but it's just, this is about making sure that people feel connected and they're not feeling lonely. And I also check it at the weekends. So um, I would stress that, you know, if, if if you're going to do something like this and label it as well-being and mental health support, you have to uh, consider that aspect of it very seriously. 
Um, so, like I say, if you have a story to tell and you would like uh, us to promote um, your, your heritage stories to an international student audience, please do get in touch. And equally, if you want to know more about how to approach setting, it, uh, setting something similar up yourself, then again, please do get in touch and I will tell you all about the training, etc. that on research that I did to put this one in place. Thank you so much, Ruthann. Thanks for sharing all of that with us. Um, it's been, well, I think it's an amazing, amazing thing uh, and, and obviously something that can be replicated uh, in lots of different ways. Um, and, and we'd love for you, the people that are with us, to put questions for Rusan, um, and we can put those questions to her towards the end after we've heard from Tom. So yeah, it's a, a, a lovely um, initiative and obviously lots of potential and lots of really uh, interesting impacts uh, for different communities. So thank you very much. Um, hopefully now we can move on to Dr. Tom Flint from Edinburgh Napier University. Um, and we're not sure if Tom, you can share your slides or if you need any help from Heather. Um, take it away. Okay, I'm just gonna give it a go. So can you see my slides now? Yes. Fantastic. Let me just press the full screen button. And for some reason, I've gone. I'm at the end. So here we are. So hopefully you can all hear me and see me and see my slides. And I'm from Edinburgh Napier University, and I work in the Centre for Interaction Design. So I'm looking at um, adapting to COVID-19 and creating memorable experiences in virtual spaces. Um, so the first thing that I want to talk about is this idea of place. Um, which, I mean, I, I'm, t I'm talking to heritage experts, so I'm sure I need to explain that place is space and meaning. Without meaning, there is no place. Um, but this is the one of the things that we want to look at is the idea that context makes a place. So this this whole concept of being a place. Um, and then the next thing that I want to talk about is telepresence, which is pretty much what I'm doing right now. Um, this is idea of being somewhere without being there right now i'm in your room wherever you are i'm right there and talking to you it's the same as when you're talking to somebody on the phone and i, I always say that when you're on the phone with somebody you're never actually in your room or in their room you're in this other space which is with the space that i'm occupying at the moment and the next idea that i want to talk about is this idea of mirror worlds and representation so we're very used to mirror worlds now mirror worlds are around us everywhere and I'll give you the example of Deliveroo. So Deliveroo, if you've watched your takeaway and your ride of coming with your takeaway on Deliveroo, then you've experienced it in a real world. The same with um, Google Maps and it's these representations of the real world inside virtual spaces that, that you know, they dominate at the moment and they're a really important part of our culture and part of what we do, of where we are. So a lot of what I talk about, I talk about in terms of Jupiter Artland. And the reason I talk about that is because I've been working with Jupiter Artland for something like 10 years. I call it a 10-year a love affair. So it's this whole thing of it's a space that I really love working in. And they're very, very open to some of the ideas that I, I put across them. And we've developed many, many different um, interactive, th interactive um, applications. Um, and so I'm moving into this idea of place plus meaning. This is the context of the space. And the other thing that's really, really great about Jupiter Artland is that it's full of context. There's a lot of context there. Um, each work, because it's, um, because it's, so well, very quickly, I'll introduce Jupiter Artland to those who've not been there because I'm just assuming that people have been there. So in Jupiter Artland is a contemporary sculpture park on the edge of Edinburgh. Um, it's sculptures are generally enormous and they're immersive. So if you look at this picture here of cells of life, that is a person standing there. So that gives you an idea of scale. Um, the sculptures are huge generally and you and they're immersive in the context that you get inside them and you can actually occupy space within those sculptures. So they're very, very interesting, very exciting spaces to be. But each sculpture has a specific context and has a specific way, a specific meaning that it's trying to compart to you. So this is the idea that you need to understand the context and one of the first things that we did was that well, when we, we built it in minecraft and i put up this picture here of laura ford's weeping girls so laura ford's weeping girls is a statue of five different girls um all life size the young girls who are in crying and very basically very sad 
So this building of it in Minecraft, the idea is that we can geographically represent it. We can create a facsimile of this space that is very similar to the real world. And um, in there, you can see that Cells of Life, we've actually built it one to one scale. And the same with this work, Love Bomb. Again, that's quite straightforward. But when it came to Weeping Girls, because they were life size, the size of a small child, then when you represent them in, in, in real size, their, their resolution is terrible and they don't look very good. So we created them this size. So they're giant sculptures, giant versions, just one giant version of the Weeping Girls to represent all the Weeping Girls. Now, we were working, we always were, we were working very closely with a school and a school class to make sure that they understood what we were doing and they accepted what we were doing. Because obviously, if we're building something like this, we're building it for children. So we'd like to build it with children. And so this idea that the context is to, to get across to other people. Now, the, the whole point of having Minecraft version of Jupiter Artland is this, this idea that um, every child in Scotland matters and deserves to be recognised. This is a mission for Jupiter Artland and they believe in um, extending themselves and giving an opportunity to every child in Scotland to visit. And this is one way that we can actually bring Jupiter Artland extend it out from from its physical confines and bring it to children in the real world. So I'm just going to move on. Um, and one of the things I want to talk about context. So here I was saying the, the context is the meaning. The context only exists inside somebody's head. And so one of the things that we look at is this idea of narrative and make-believe. And I, and I really fundamentally believe that um, narrative and make-believe is how we engage with context. And it's the whole thing with digital products is the fact that if you use narrative and use stories, what we do as human beings, we learned to do make-believe when we were very young. Um, I get most of my students at one time or another to have a tea party with me to show them that they know how to make-believe, they know how to make, how to pretend and play. And so, and so this whole idea of, the, of narrative and make-believe being this powerful means for bringing people into um, into immersive content, the next part of my sort of my my my, tr my my triangle is technology, and technology is a medium through which we can put context and place. We can we can impart them, and it's really important that we don't just use technology because we want to use technology. Um, it's very important that we use technology and we have a reason for it. So here in this what we what we're looking at there so let's have a look this is the mixed reality continuum so you start off over here with the real environment augmented reality uh, augmented virtuality and virtual environment I, i'm not going to get into terms and um, i mean i spent the you know, i'm going to kind of spend my life sort of defining these different things and talking about them but it's this way that we cross over that so with jupiter artland we built a mixed reality game that was played on site through um through tablets it was like a treasure hunt so that the, and we made a context for it, the story we developed with children from the local from a local school to. Um, and the idea was that they were tri tri creatures trapped in Minecraft who needed to escape. So this is point we have this technology. We had Minecraft already built and um, COVID-19 hit and we were talking to with Jupiter Artland. They, they, they were talking with me about what could we possibly do. So what you can do with Minecraft is you can put it onto a server and you can invite people to come and see them, see the worlds. We had the world already built. We put it onto this server. And then for Easter, we created a, an Easter egg hunt, which was great fun. If you want to have a look at what that looks like, then there's a YouTube video which you can search for. But you can see that we had many, many people. And we extended this. So we decided that it would be a really wonderful idea to create a, um, a, um, a sculpture competition and the winner of the sculpture competition will be announced soon but their sculpture will become a permanent part of the jupiter Artland in minecraft collection now um if i just want to move on now this is a video of some of the sculptures that have been shown in jupiter Artland. so i'm hoping this works because i can't actually hear or see anyone so this is a fly through and I this is around the edge of the park this is around the edge of the park 
where children have contributed and made their own sculptures is a very, very small part of it. It is extraordinary. I've been talking to children from Thailand. I've been talking to children from Russia, helping them get on, get on board and helping them connect to this server. And you see, as we fly around the park, we've got, and there's a lot of rainbows that appear. Um, my favorite, one of my favorite sculptures is turning up and it, you know what it does, it's here and it uses smoke to create this sort of atmospheric environment. So it's a really, I, I, I don't know if it renders particularly well in this video, but there's fire and smoke down there, which is all billowing up and it's, looks incredible. Um, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna, we're gonna verge round and go into the cells of life and land in them. You can see from that perspective, how this is um, actually life size. So here we go, we're gonna fly in and then you can see the cells of life right there. And we're just gonna come to land. Okay, so I'm conscious of time and I'm just going to move on and that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to go there. So we have this number of different things that we're starting to work on and we what we want to do is want to play in this space here. And what we can do with narrative is we can use it to help people transition from one point on this space to another. We have all kinds of things. We have an iPhone app. Um, we have an audio guide, which is thanks to an interface um, innovation voucher. We have the map, the, the app that works in between the two spaces. I've been recording 360 video, which I showed at one point. You can see those on my video. We're look, about to release those, but they're a way of extending and going there. Um, and we also have what I'm calling Project X, which I'm not allowed to talk about, but hopefully that's very exciting and will be coming to you very soon. OK, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to come back. So that's a real, really sort of brief overview of what we're doing there in just one space where we're creating many, many different mirror worlds. We're creating many different opportunities of interacting um, virtually with it. And it's great because by having these different, different things and by having a reason for them to exist, we can then roll them out and use them in different situations, which was really great with COVID-19 because we could just respond very, very quickly um, to that. Um, so that's all I have to say. And thank you for having me. And I'm going to move back over to Leslie, I believe. Okay, thank you very thank much. You very much. much um, that was, um, that was uh, very interesting as well. Another uh, different perspective on, on engaging with audiences, okay. different audiences. So um, I'll start with, with some questions for Ruthann. Um, a question, well, I think similar questions from Brian and Pooja. They were interested to know how the heritage was specifically delivered. So I think Pooja was um, asking if who was filming the videos. And I think Brian wanted to know how, how you know, through your visits, how the heritage is, is delivered. So maybe if you could expand a little bit about that. Yeah, so I mean, the all of the footage is already there. So it's um, virtual tours, etc., and online exhibitions that the um, heritage partners already have. And what is really interesting to note is, you, you know, anybody, any one of us can just sit for hours endlessly on sort of Google Arts and Culture. But for these young people who are not in the best headspace, um, just sometimes they need a wee helping hand. They need to have it structured. Um, so it's uh, the the resources, if you like, are out there and they're on the internet. But some people just need to make it structured for them. So nobody created anything particularly new. Um, it is more about the heritage organisations making more, if you like, of what they have already got as online digital resource. Great, thank you. I hope that answers uh, questions for Pooja and for Brian. Um, and for Tom, um, are you sort of carrying on working? You, you said you're developing more uh, projects with Jupiter Artland at the moment. Yeah, um, I, mean, I mean, I'll keep working with Jupiter Artland as long as they tolerate me. Um, they're incredibly generous with their, with, their, with their space and their time and, and their archive. Um, and they're also really open to create new things. So yeah, we we will continue to work for as long as I'm 
as I'm able to, and I'm hoping in way off into the future. Um, they're just open to really, really extraordinary ideas. And I, I got very excited about certain technologies, but then it's always such a wonderful place to try and get a context for that technology to actually work in. That's great. We've just had a comment from Stephen Bullock, who says that the National Creative Learning Network would love to connect with your work, Tom, um, or or with Jupiter Artland, if that's a good way to connect. But I'm sure that you can connect with Stephen um, after this uh, webinar. I'd love to, Stephen. Yeah, please do get in touch. Great. Um, we have another question for Ruth Ann, and that's from me. Um, did you find was it a challenge when you were trying to get lots of different venues and speakers on board you know obviously not only in scotland but across the world were there any challenges in in, in doing that or were people very willing uh, no no everybody was very willing um there were a few people uh for example there was a lady who connected with them um, with me in america the smithsonian and she just basically said, I'd love to be part of this, but we, a lot of her staff are in furlough and she said, we are prioritizing reopening. So the problem that I sort of found much more recently is that some of the countries are going back into a reopening phase and um, therefore just not available right now. However, the project, because it was created for the University of Edinburgh students, many of the students, the uni is at the moment planning to have about between 20 and 25 percent of students back on campus, but that means that 75 percent of our students will still be out living across the globe. So um, what started off was me rather foolishly thinking I just need to do this for about eight weeks and then that's that done. Um, it might look more like I may have to do it for about eight months. <laughs> so um, fortunately I'm having no problems. I have, if I'm honest, I have some contacts um, across the world, but the majority of the venues that I'm finding, I am literally stalking people on LinkedIn. And if they have a job title like curator or head of visitor experience, etc., I just drop them a message on LinkedIn and um, just explain that I am reaching out for their support for a student mental health um, heritage uh, program. And so far in the main, everybody's been really, really helpful. That's great. That's really good to hear. That's very encouraging. Um, another question for Tom from uh, Pooja and, and Brian. So um, Pooja saying it's a fun project. Is the virtual park environment created for a VR app or is it accessible through a URL? So that was Minecraft. So you would have, you would need a Minecraft, particularly the Java version, to see that version. But um, I'm creating 360 video at the moment. It's it's a big project because I have to, um, it's not a funded project, so I'm doing it in my spare time uh, where I'm trying to create all 360 video. But you can see 360 video on Vimeo if you go onto my channel. Um, and if you send me if you send me an email, I, I, I gave out a load of cardboard viewers at the last interface meeting and I need to I want to give some some more out now as well. Um, so if you send me an email, I'll try and post you a cardboard viewer or just get one off Amazon. They're very cheap. <laughs> 360 video 360 video with a mobile phone. It's it's unbelievably strong. It's unbelievably powerful. Could I just I suppose following on from that, is there uh, and I suppose for both of you as well, is um in terms of targeting certain audiences, do you is there sort of a winning formula in terms of what platform you use for, you know, whether it's obviously Minecraft more for the youngsters, I'm guessing. But, you know, do you sort of really have to think, who am I targeting at? What kind of age group or demographic? And therefore, what platform do I put this on? Um, do you want to answer that, Ruth, or do I? Do I... Um, well, for, for me personally, the I've obviously been tapping into the universities and um, various schools networks. So we have the each of the colleges has um, like a comms and, and PR department, um, and they've been sending the message out to the staff and students in their college. Um, and the other, you know, the, it's it's quite, that side of it's easier for me, but the other part of that is that a lot of it is by referral. So in the very first instance, I went back to the original prescribed culture referral partners, who are the GP service, the counselling service, the chaplaincy and the student support team. So they um, were all aware of it first. So I've got, you know, quite a bit of um, direct audience or, or most uh, appropriate audience going uh, through those channels. 
Um, it's not really something that is being broadly marketed, if you like. Um, and if I can answer that, yeah. So, so, so my first go-to is: Can you find something free to be able to do that? That you know, so free and available on the phone. It, you know, they're my primary concerns. But you know, a lot of my work. I mean, I'm very lucky in that I work for a university, so I'll often have technology that's available to me, or I will have willing students who want a project to build things. So that's where I've become very lucky. But it's, I mean, you know, for me, it's free. Free if if you, if it can be experienced. With a mobile phone, with a with with not particularly good mobile phone, I'll go for that. But yes, audience is always key. I mean, nearly all my projects are co-designed. You know, they're designed with an audience. This is a very very much a, an important part. When I'm working with Jupiter Art, I'm working with the with the Learning Foundation. So the idea is that we're trying to create um, opportunities for learning for young people. So that that's very young people focused. Um, other projects that I do, you know, obviously it so depends on where it's being shown, why it's being shown. But as I say, there's always got to be a reason for that thing to exist. And that's that will that will guide what, what platform you put it onto. OK, thank you, Tom. Um, I think um, there's been quite a few questions from various people um, around. Um, is anyone interested in the storytelling of submerged cultural heritage, for example, historical shipwrecks? Um, and people have been having their own conversation around this, but um, have you guys got anything to comment? <laughs> Either Ruth and Tom, both of you? I would basically say that definitely, certainly the students that I'm working with just now would love, they, they, they don't have specifics, anything that's old and interesting and engaging, they're up for that. So definitely um, submerged cultural heritage would be fantastic. Okay, sounds good. I, I I would reiterate that. I mean, who isn't interested in submerged cultural heritage? That's that's a question that I'd have for you. Um, one of the things I say, and I, and I keep, I, I'm almost like a sort of droning advert for 360 photography, but it, it, it really works. And one of the things that it will allow you to do is access places that you can't normally go. And the great thing about 360 cameras is that most of them are waterproof. I will put a caveat on that. I've never tested them at depth. But they all seem to think that they're waterproof anyway. OK, OK, that's good to know. Um, in terms of your both of you, Tom and Ruthann, as speakers, have you got any um, sort of curiosities or, or questions or, you know, about some of the people that have joined us today in terms of, um, you know, whether they're, you know, local councils, they might be museum collections, um you know attractions venues tour operators um other universities perhaps um because obviously ruthann your project i think could be replicated in many ways um and tom for for other organizations that are maybe considering embarking on you know immersive experiences and using 360 video or or, or vr for the first time um you know maybe there's Obviously, we can follow up with people and give them. We've got lots of information we can give them. But have you got any thoughts on that? Uh, yes, yeah, so I will first, Tom, if that's okay. Um, yeah, I would just suggest um, that if you are wanting to uh, create something that is heritage supporting um, well-being, that you very much just have discussions with whatever your form of local. Um, mental health support people are. Uh, it's really important um, with prescribed culture, it is absolutely not a therapy. Um, we don't put that word anywhere near it. That is a completely different discipline and you have to be extremely specialised. Um, I have to say that I'm really, really proud of the fact that the entire museums team at the university are now all trained in mental health first aid and the uh, heritage partners who very kindly came on board for the um, pilot they were all also trained in mental health uh, first aid and it was really just to make sure that they had an awareness they didn't have to do anything but just so that they had a general awareness and um what we look for uh, is the safeguarding of the young person um the the, the virtual program that we're doing just now is a, a is a different thing because it's self-referral uh where people just sort of feel for themselves that they need that support the previous, the ones in the pilot, the programme six, that will go ahead again in the next academic year, maybe not starting until January, but that's sort of a live one where you get very sort of hands on after uh, exploring um, a collection or an object. And uh, 
one of the key things about that is that that will only be by referral. So we will only be bringing on students who have been referred by the counselling service or the GP for that particular support. And that is so that if they had a particularly difficult time, we can encourage them to go back and see their professional mental health support. OK, OK, thank you. Tom? Um, yeah, so I, I mean, so it's getting back to that whole idea of have a reason for it. Now, one of the projects I'm working on is called Blended Spaces. I won't go into it here, but it's this whole idea that a lot of people develop technology for technology and they forget why they're developing it. And it's so important to make sure that you have a reason for using that technology and um, a story to tell through the technology and how is that technology the best way to do it. I'm also going to really advertise um, Mary Pittock's um, guide on immersive experiences and I'd be really grateful if they, if during the notes you could put a link to that. It's such a good, re good read. It's got a really sort of guide of why do you want virtual, what do you want out of um, immersive experiences. Um, they've done a lot of work in, in surveying people and asking the, asking the right questions. So read that first, have a reason for it and have a chat, you know, get in touch and ask me, you know, what is, what is, what are you trying to do? Why are you trying to do it? And then we can try and work out some, some way of doing that for you. Thank you. Yes, we actually have um, some of the resources that we're we're going to send out to people um, are Murray Pittock's report, which was the Scott uh, Scott Immersives, the Scottish Heritage um, research into what people in some Scottish visitor attractions wanted from immersive experiences in different age groups and different demographics. We also have um, uh, some resources on how to write a VR brief. Um, from his colleague Neil McDonnell at University of Glasgow and a costing template. So um, there's a lot of resources that we can follow up with. Um, it's now three o'clock. I'm conscious of time and that other people will um, already have um, had to go or have other calls. Um, I'll take one more question. So thank you for the people that have joined us and have had to go. Um, I'll take one more question, um, which is, for Ruthann, what do you think will happen to the T30 project once travel restrictions are lifted and people can actually visit the heritage sites? Um, to be honest, that's something that I will very much do in consultation with the, the membership um, of, of the Take 30 programme. I very much feel that you know there is no immediate um, intention for everybody to be going rushing back to their offices and to their um, sort of university campuses. Uh, but once everybody can be out and about and won't necessarily be stuck in their house every lunchtime, um, you know, we might just, I'll have a discussion with the membership and see if they feel it's still worth doing at a different time of day, in a different format, or whether just having um, all, all lockdown released uh, means that it, it's, it's played its part and it's then redundant, which also is, if, uh, that's fine as well. Great answer, thank you. We actually have some more questions, but um, what we will do is, if you don't mind uh, the people that are still with us, we'll put those to Tom and Ruthann, and as I say, we'll follow up um, with, with everything um, from today on the blog. Um, thank you, everyone that joined us. We're very sorry about the technical <laughs> the technical um, hitches at the beginning, and um, we appreciate your patience. Um, as, as, as everyone is, we're all learning. Um, so um, we will um, make sure that we have it slicker for the next time. But um, um, it's been very interesting to hear from both our speakers, uh, Ruthann Baxter uh, from Museums Collections from University of Edinburgh and Dr Tom Flint from uh, Edinburgh Napier University. And thank you um, for joining us. Um, details on the screen just now. Um, my email address is there. We have another webinar on the 17th of June. Um, which is focused on food and drink uh, with different technology, you'll be pleased to hear. So um, <laughs> uh, if you're interested in joining that one, you can register. Um, we'll be in touch. There's lots of um, interest, I think, for both of our speakers today. And we thank you both very much for, for giving us your time. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. And we shall close up now, but we'll be in touch soon with follow-up. And um, we look forward to hearing from you. Um, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.